Good morning. Welcome to Member Focus Monday. I'm Christina Schaefer, Director of Social Media for HAR, and I'm joined this morning by a very familiar face to most of us, Nathan Goebel. Nathan, welcome. Thank you for having me, Christina. Thank you for joining us. Nathan is HAR's MLS project manager, and we are going to be talking all things Matrix MLS this morning. Um, some exciting updates that have taken place, some exciting updates that are coming. And also, Nathan, being the Matrix guru that he is, has some helpful tips to help every realtor that's watching this program today. So, uh, if you can, if you're in a safe place to do it, take some notes today. Nathan also did prepare some slides that we're going to be sharing with you later on in the comments. So thank you, Nathan, for that. Um, for anybody who doesn't know Nathan, though, Nathan, if you don't mind giving us really quickly just a little bit about who you are and what you do. Certainly. Um, I've been with HAR for just over 18 years, and HAR is all I've ever known. Uh, my primary responsibilities at HAR they include overseeing software development and implementation of rules and regulation enforcement and maintaining the integrity of the MLS. Excellent. Thank you. And I will go ahead and say this. You do a great job at it. And I know our <laughs> members watching appreciate it, too. <laughs> um, yeah. So your department has been very busy over the last year um, with, with an increase of services for members. Can you tell us about some of the updates and, and changes to services that have taken place over the last year? Absolutely. It was a challenge, you know, no one expected, but I think we <clears throat> we think we met it uh, about as well as anyone could be expected to. As soon as we met into remote operation in mid-March last year, we opened up the HAR chat inside the members only portal full time. And prior to that, it was only open on Saturday and Sunday. Um, since we've opened it up full time, we've handled more than 15,000 chats. Um, we also uh, enhanced our weekend operation to be open from 930 to 3. And that was also for chat and phone calls. And, um, you know, that made us a seven day operation. And we've been a seven day operation ever since. And I think our members have benefited from that because it used to be you'd have an issue on Friday afternoon. And if it was after five o'clock, you weren't going to get uh, the service maybe until Monday morning. And now yeah. you don't have to worry about that. You could catch us Saturday morning first thing, and there would be someone available uh, for you. In, in addition to that, uh, we launched labs in October and, and that's been one of my favorite new things to see because it's a very live dynamic uh, free form that's from uh, two, uh, from 10 to 12 uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays and any member can just hop in and ask a question or a how to and anyone else that's live on the stream can benefit from that question and two very experienced uh, matrix users uh, or staff uh, teach and answer those questions. Very good. And I believe there's also an evening one as well. Once yes. A month? In fact, we'll, we'll be having one this week. The, the second Wednesday of each month, we have a night, a night version of virtual labs, and that's from 6 to 8 p.m. Very good. Do you find that members are utilizing um, the chat? That just feels like a very easy service to use. You know, they're using the chat, but they're not using it as much as I think they could be. Um, in, in some days, we only have 20 to 40 chats and we're taking four to 500 phone calls. And if, if you're in a rush and you hit that chat, normally someone responds within a couple seconds. And, and that really, really, it, it's, it's a membership services staff or a quality assurance staff. And, and they can answer the same questions that can be answered on the phone. And they can even use screenshots to provide answers uh, to something that might be related to matrix or the tax system. Okay, well, that's that's great to know. So if anyone was confused or thought that was maybe some sort of outside service, those are <laughs> HAR staff. Um, Bev is asking, where is the chat? If you could remind us again where that is. In the When you're in the members only portal in the bottom right side, there's a HAR, there's a chat button that you can click on. And when you click on that, it asks you if you need help with member services or the MLS. And depending on the option you select, depends on which representative responds and they can even transfer it. So if you start out in member services and then you're like, oh, I have a MLS question, they can transfer you over to the MLS rep and it's it's all seamless inside the same chat for you. Very good. And I see uh, Caesar just said, I've used the chat and it's great. I'd be curious to know if anyone else has, has utilized it that's uh, watching the program today. Um, so HAR has a, almost a record number of members right now. We've, we've heard about mm -hmm. how many members have joined over the last year. Has the increase in membership caused um, our hold times to be longer for people that are calling in? Well, the average hold time is pretty much in line with last year, uh, but we do see increased call volume uh, and wait times during certain times of service interruption for non-payment or when we suspend for quality assurance uh, violations. 
Um, remember, we have over 41,000 members uh, that, that could call at any time or, you, or use the chat at any time. And we are continuing to add staff to meet that demand of the growing membership and providing cross-training to our department so they can help when a, they say there's a spike in one department so that the other department can assist as a backflow. Mm -hmm. uh, in April alone, we took more than 12,000 phone calls and our average hold time was less than a minute and a half. Um, while there certainly can be spikes on certain days for certain for certain reasons, um, we're always working to answer those calls as quickly as possible. Excellent, excellent. Um, and I see a few other people have said that they also use the chat. So I'm glad to hear that that service is, is really paying off for our members. So thank you for, for letting us know about that and hopefully more members will start utilizing it. Absolutely. So Nathan, you're in the data every single day. Um, we've, we've seen headlines, we've seen reports about how the market is. Um, can you just give us a brief update on, on how the Houston market is doing? Oh, the, the easy answer is sales are up, prices are up, months of inventory is down. Um, small preview of what's going to be in Wednesday's uh, monthly press release uh, for our MLS statistics is that this was the fifth highest uh, month of sales on record and that closed and pending listings continue to outpace new listings. Uh, while the months of inventory for Houston as a whole is 1.4 and continues to hold at 1.4, there are many markets that are below that. Uh, for my area where I live in Katy, all four markets in Katy are at 1.1 or lower. Mm -hmm. uh, you can use the months of inventory report inside uh, the market reports in Matrix uh, to see where your market stands. And that will give you a real-time <clears throat> number to show you what the months of inventory is for your area. That's that's great. That's a great suggestion because, like you said, that that is going to be different for different parts of town. So, absolutely, um, yeah. And again, Nathan did prepare some slides that we'll share uh, a link to all the slides later on in the in the comments for everybody that's interested. So, um, the months of inventory report in the market reports. Uh, take a look at that. Um, so what are some other ways that members can keep an eye on the data? I mean, I, we like you said, we have the monthly market update that goes out the second Wednesday of every month. People get it straight to right. their email. We also put it all over social media. But what mm -hmm. are some ways that members can keep an eye on that data daily? Right, because you know, in, in this market, monthly and even weekly, you know, it isn't enough. <clears throat> you see it on the Facebook Platinum page and other social media is about things needing to be more more urgent. Mm -hmm. um, so if you haven't already, you should set yourself up as a contact in Matrix and you should create auto emails that are sent to yourself for your markets that you're concerned with. And you should set it to ASAP and ASAP runs every 15 minutes. So if a new listing goes live in Matrix within 15 minutes, you're going to know about it. If there's a price change within 15 minutes, you're going to know about it. Um, and those are based off of when the listing's updated. So it's not, you know, when it appears on a website, it's when the user actually saved the listing itself. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to the auto emails, I highly recommend setting up your, <clears throat> your market watch inside the homepage. That homepage, the market watch by default is programmed to the entire market. Uh, so what you can do is you select the property class and hit customize, and then you can change the criteria to fit what you're actually concerned with. And this way, then you can quickly get a snapshot of market activity based on what's happened today, the past 24 hours, the past three days, or the past seven days. And if you want more than one market watch for, say, single family, I would recommend using the all properties as the last option and configuring that towards single family. And that's that way you could have two market watches uh, for at your use. That's wonderful. And, and like you said, at a glance, right there on the home screen of Matrix, I can see the, the updates and the changes. I know there's a member who's been posting how many new listings uh, right. <laughs> hit the market in the Platinum Subscriber Facebook group lately. But again, that market that market watch is helpful for everyone to be able to see that data on their own. Um, any Any others? Any other options there? Um. Or are there any other time-saving tools within Matrix that members should consider using? Yeah, it's for time-saving tools, um, mm -hmm. one of my favorites is the speed bar shortcut. And the speed bar shortcut uh, can be used to quickly search for something uh, just by typing in a word at the top. And so the way you would do this is you would run your search, uh, but instead of clicking new search, uh, a new save search or new auto email, you'd select new speed bar search. And so say I was gonna be farming a village like the Woodlands, uh, uh, Panther Creek, a village in Panther Creek. And knowing the difficulties of the subdivision name for that area, it's expressed five different ways. It's better to create a map. 
And if you create the map, um, I don't know about you, but I don't want to create a subdivision map every single time I'm searching for Panther Creek. So what you do is you draw that map and then you save it uh, as, a, as, as a new speed bar shortcut. And when you do that, you want to make sure that you give it an easy name. Um, you give it an easy name so that you can easily type it into the top. So in this case, I gave it the name Panther. And once I name it Panther, uh, at the top, I can type in slash and then Panther at any time. And then it's going to return those results specific to that search criteria. And so that can help you save time instantly. And you can see that Panther right there returns all of those results without, without you having to do anything else besides typing in the one word. In addition to this, um, for farming, so say you're farming multiple areas, uh, is creating, uh, saving your custom searches to the home page. Mm. You can save up to 10 of these on there. So say you have five primary markets you farm every day, you want to check every day, you just want to have an open search. So you create a search, and when you go to save that custom search, there is an option to enable as a favorite search on the home tab. And then you give it a name, and once you do, on the My Favorite Searches widget, it will display that search there that you can simply click on at any time and get those results. And so say you're farming and you get calls, you can click on that and then hit revise criteria to change the price or whatever the client's looking for to provide the instant results. And you don't have to spend the time building the search to that one point the, that they need. Uh, finally, and, and my personal favorite is, is related to violations and not searching. And this is a widget that is sometimes buried on some people's homepage is the listing data checker. And the listing data checker widget will tell you in real time if you have any violations. Mm. I recommend taking that widget and moving it from the bottom right corner, if it's there, to underneath news and alerts. And by putting it there, all you need to do is identify red text. If, it, if there's red text there that says, you know, violation, you can click on that. And when you click on that violation, it will then tell you uh, what the notice is regarding, what listing it was for, uh, when we sent the notice to you, the current state of the notice, and then when the notice needs to be addressed by to avoid being fined. We know that email is fallible and you may not receive the emails, so we encourage you to be more dependent on this widget that's always there and is directly tied to the system we use for notifications. Excellent. That's very helpful. So if you're if you haven't seen that uh, data listing checker, look for it on your home screen, move it around so it's a little more visible for you. Um, we have a question that came in. Well, a comment really from Shannon. She said she hasn't been able to figure out how to send auto emails to clients in Matrix. I know we um, have a lot of tutorial videos, but do you have any suggestions for her? Um, well, the tutorial videos are, are immensely helpful because I mean, you re we recently did a webinar on how to do auto emails and that, that video is of course available on our uh, YouTube t uh, channel for tutorials. Uh, but setting it up is, is as simple as once you do a search, you go down to the bottom, you hit save, and you'll see an option that says uh, send an auto email. And when you do that, you follow the steps to attach it to a contact and then to determine how often you want to send it to them. You have the choice of ASAP, daily, weekly, or monthly, uh, and then and then you send it off. And from there, it's automated. Uh, okay. The only time the system will turn that off is if no results are generated for 90 days or your client doesn't click on the link for, I think, 180. Okay, that's a long time. <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned um, violations. You know, we get questions on social media a lot about how to report MLS violations. So can you explain that process? Certainly. Uh, there, there's more. There's multiple ways to report violations to us. And our recommended way is to report it through the Report It button located mm -hmm. inside the agent full report on a listing. And when you click on that, that's going to open up a window that gives you a series of options for what violation are you reporting? And then at the bottom, it has a, t a note box for you to give more context. And this is once you click the submit button, it's automatically added to our queue inside of our inside of our workflow and quality assurance. In April alone, there were 869 reported violations to to us through that method. That doesn't count anything that could have also come through. Excuse me, uh, email, which is mlsqa at hr.com. If you need to send documentation to support your complaint, um, then that would be the, the avenue you'd go because the report it button doesn't allow attachments. And so you send to MLS QA and that goes into a different workflow, but it gets worked just the same. And of course, you can always call us and we can talk to you 
about uh, the complaint you may have, which may end up in you sending us an email uh, so that we have it in writing and the documentation that we may need to support it. And no matter which way you report a notice to the MLS, uh, it is always, always anonymous. Okay, very good. Um, we actually had a question come in about a specific violation. Um, Bev said, we're seeing more and more agents posting title info and the agent remarks and attachments. Is that a violation? Is still a violation or has that changed? It's still a violation. And, and actually that kind of leads into to the next point um, that the title information, the agent remarks, you know, is, is the violations on the rise. And we have now created a way to identify listings that have specific title information in the agent remarks and we are notifying for it. And we started about three weeks ago with uh, 72 or 73 title company title companies. Mm -hmm. And since then, the title uh, in the agent remarks has, has broken into our top 10 violations being sent out. Um, and it is so, uh, so prevalent that we are looking to automate it so that we can take that workload off of the staff that's just hitting confirm, 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 confirm. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it is still a violation. The rule has not changed. You cannot have t specific title information in the agent remarks. You cannot have title information in an attachment to your listing. And the only thing you can really say in the agent remarks about title is contact listing agent for specific title information. That should be the extent. And the primary reason uh, that many may remember or may not is it was due to wire fraud increases that we saw a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. and. We were seeing correlations between some of the wire fraud information and the agent remarks and the MLS, and we wanted to remove that as a possible variable being used uh, by the scammers. Okay. Charles had a question. Um, if you could just clarify what is and what is not allowed there. So he just said, what kind of title info is a violation? So you basically said, contact the agent None. is what they should put. Contact the agent. You yeah. should have no, t you should have nothing that specifically refers to any title, the title, the title company, the phone number, their address, the, the officer's name. None of that should be in the MLS. Okay. It should, if you, if you, if you want to have something there, it's just contact the agent for title information. Okay. You mentioned that that's broken t into the top 10. Um, out of curiosity and because it's helpful to our members to hear, <laughs> what are some of the most frequent violations that are currently being reported? Well, um, uh, to add on to that, we've already issued more than 32,000 violations uh, through the first four months of this year. And that means we're averaging 8,000 violations a month uh, in, in the quality assurance department. And the top five violations right now are mostly our usual suspects. Uh, estimated closing date is in the past. It accounts for 69% of all of our correction notices that we issue. Insufficient number of photographs is at 5%. Then, uh, that's for not having at least six. You have to have at least six unique images for every property class except for land, which only needs one. Physical property description violations is number three, and that would be for having public information or transaction-related information in the public remarks. Mm -hmm. The school district is number four. A surprising one to me because schools is a very important characteristic of a property, and there's 5% of our notices are going to agents that are putting the wrong school district on their listing. So they're putting Cy Fair instead of Katie. And this is something we're actually uh, looking to address internally this year. And then finally, tax ID. Um, one of the issues we have there is many agents will put NA if they don't know the tax ID, uh, but then our system does know the tax ID. And so we will issue a notice telling them what the tax ID should be uh, for them to update it in there. Now, okay. regarding those notices, 90% of our notices are addressed within the grace period and less than 1% of those notices result in suspension. So 99% so of violations are addressed, you know, within short order. All right. Um, there was a couple questions that came in. Andy asked, um, and this is taking us to a different topic here, but um, this is taking sure. us back to some stats and some reporting there. Any possibility of adding more options to display data on the stats page, i.e. results on a map, grouping, MOI by MLS area or geo market area, et cetera? It, it's, on my, it's on my wish list too, Andy. <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a data guy, I'm a numbers guy, and I'm, I'm definitely a GIS guy. Um, there is a, some stats that you can display on the map if you go into the layers. Um, section of the of the search and you can turn on some trends that are there but the data is limited and not configurable really by the user 
Um, but those are those are certainly things we have on our whiteboard of things we'd like to be able to do in, in future iterations of Matrix, uh, because that's one of my weaknesses in stats is that you don't have the control of sorting it or grouping it by anything other than month or by year. And and I know that you want to do something more complex, say by month, by year, and by a geo a geo market area or some physical uh, value. Okay. So I hope so. Okay. Very good. Um, there was a question here, and I think this is probably another whiteboard for the future kind of topic. But uh, Frederick said, "Is there a way to link the online portal with the HAR app through the uh, through the app so it can be seamlessly added or removed from a client's portal?" Definitely a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. uh, that that would lean in, that would lean into a, a long term project we have of of being able to unify those two systems to each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. There's some conversation going on about the uh, wire fraud and stuff like that, but it, just some different opinions and with, with how busy our members sure. are, it's it's sometimes difficult to get the information they Certainly. need quickly. So it's definitely something we understand, but it's it's all meant to protect the consumer. Um, protect the consumer and the it, agent. Yeah. And the agent, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's talk about another topic that seems to have a lot of questions <laughs> surrounding it. And that is clear cooperation or coming soon or however somebody is going to, they call it both. Um, but so right. what can you review the policy for us, number one, and also tell us about how those violations are reported? Well, number one, uh, clear cooperation and coming soon are two different things. One is a policy which is clear cooperation and coming soon as a status. Uh, so that, that's that's kind of the confusion that continues to persist out there. Now, the clear cooperation policy states that any listing that is publicly marketed must be put into the MLS within one business day, uh, not 24 hours, not one calendar day, but one business day. And so there, um, that there is that confusion that continues to exist out there. And so it's definitely one business day. And examples of public marketing is anything you can think of yard signs brokerage websites private social media groups email blasts phone calls anything that's outside of the brokerage once some form of marketing gets outside of the brokerage about this property it needs to be in the mls uh, once you become aware of this type of property uh, that may not be in compliance we recommend you emailing mlsqa at har.com with the specific property address the listing agent information and the type of marketing that you observed uh, once we receive this information, we send out a notice to the listing agent uh, to have this corrected. Uh, after an agent has been notified twice for the clear cooperation policy, future notices uh, may result in automatic fines uh, for, for not complying with that. Okay. Coming soon is, is a status. Now, mm -hmm. coming soon is a status that a listing may be in for up to 14 days. And so when you put a listing into coming soon, you can have it there for up to 14 days. And if you don't take any action in that 14 days, the system will automatically update your listing to the withdrawn status. While you have it in the coming soon status, showings are not permitted. Uh, if you're going to have a showing, you need to change the status to active. Uh, it's the same with the withdrawn status. Withdrawn status can't have showings either. If you're going to be showing the property, it needs to be in the active status. The same for open houses as well. Um, you can receive offers. Obviously, people submit offers sight unseen. That does not require the property to be made active, um, but uh, you will need to update it to a pending status if you do execute on that offer. Um, there are some agents I've heard uh, call and complain about accidentally making their listing active when they try to use the coming soon status. Mm -hmm. And there is a way to work around this. And I know that tab can be confusing to, to some. What I recommend doing is not using that tab. So when you're done with your listing, you would hit save as incomplete. Mm -hmm. And then you would go back to the add edit form and you'll see there's an option that says change to coming soon. And that's all it does. So if you're done with your listing and you're ready to go coming soon, use that instead and you will guarantee your listing is going to go coming soon and not accidentally go active and, and maybe make it out to the web as an active listing that we then have to work to pull back from hundreds of websites. Okay. Um, just a quick comment here. Heather says, coming soon status satisfies the requirement of being in the MLS within one business day. Yep. Okay. Very good. Um, so and I'm sure we'll have some questions come in um, for that. Uh, there were a few questions that I'm going to get to. I see Peter just said, can you add a field for the agent to add an estimated active date to coming soon? 
I believe that is as actually a, currently a suggestion to be reviewed. Okay, wonderful. Good to hear. Um, so I want to talk about some uh, database updates and I do see a, a few questions. If you asked a question, don't worry, I'm, I'm gonna get to them. But I wanna talk about some of the changes um, that have taken place, uh, recent changes in, within Matrix. Um, and then also, Nathan, if you could tell us about anything that's coming soon. Certainly. <laughs> no pun intended there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, recent updates to Matrix, uh, you know, we had the large series of updates last year. Mm -hmm. And we had the, the first rewrite of Matrix to modernize the, the context section, widening of the map for high resolution monitors so that you could search full screen with the map, and then updating the icons throughout the system to be, to be larger and more easily clickable. Mm -hmm. uh, we also published a series of database updates uh, that included the garage square foot for single family homes. Um, we also made uh, a cell score searchable feature in Realist. Um, but he, as far as what's coming soon, and hopefully it's coming within the next two weeks, is uh, the ETJ map. We've heard your feedback regarding the PDF, and we'll be making a native layer uh, of the ETJ map available in Matrix within the next few weeks. This layer will allow you to see the uh, city limits and ETJ boundaries for the greater Houston area. Uh, as this, this is the first version of this map, uh, feedback is welcome, and every map we've rolled out, you know, has had significant changes made after the after our members see it. Y'all are a vocal group, and we appreciate that feedback to to improve the product and make it the best for you. Um, but in addition to making this map available as a visible layer, we're going to take it to the next step, and we're going to use uh, just like we do a geo market area. Mm -hmm. We're going to auto populate the value that may match your listing. And so if your property is out in Katy and you auto populate, it's going to say that it's in the Houston ETJ, uh, most likely. And then it's going to auto populate on the listing record, which will help you put uh, or make the selection on the HAR 400 form uh, where you're disclosing whether the property is within the city limits or within its or whether it's within the ETJ boundaries and then what those boundaries are. And this will be for basically just the greater Houston area. If it's outside of our primary market, uh, it's not going to return a result. It's just going to it's just going to be blank. Um, next, we're looking to publish an update to our school boundaries in Matrix. Uh, we've submitted our updated boundaries for the 2021-2022 school year. Um, and if, for those of you that may not know, we we research that internally ourselves mm -hmm. uh, so that we can have the most current and accurate school boundaries for our members as well as the newest schools. Uh, whenever a new school is added, it can take up to two years for a site like Zillow. Uh, to have that information and that's because they they get their information from a national level and national uh, levels don't normally get new schools for or at least one year because they have to take one round of standardized tests to get those that, that information uh, so for us this year we you know we cover 324 school districts and encompasses 2300 schools one of the big changes we're adding to this this year is we're adding a fourth layer called additional school and this is going to really benefit a school district like say conroe that has an elementary school, an intermediate school, a middle school, and a high school. Uh, we've always only displayed those three schools, and after this update, we're going to have a fourth layer that will have all of those intermediate schools available to be searched and seen on the listings. And we're going to have a grand total of 164 changes that'll be happening to our, to our schools uh, when the publish occurs, and we expect that by the end of June. Wow, very good. Let's see. Go the going going one one more thing with the schools is the school districts and this goes back to the violations uh, we said number four was school districts well we're looking to auto populate school districts with a new layer update and that'll take that issue away and it'll drop it you know out of existence it's the same thing that happened with area several years ago where area used to be a high violation for us mm -hmm. we started auto populating it and now it's not an issue for anyone outside yeah it's just not an issue okay. um we have database changes coming in the third quarter um, that will update the data input sheets and update the forms managers. And then we are working on an enhanced map search function inside Matrix that's going to, uh, Fusion users may, may, know, may recognize it as it's gonna have the search criteria on the left, the map on the right, and then the, the results right underneath it. Uh, but we're not sure when that's coming. I just know that it, it is on the roadmap. Excellent. That that will be a wonderful addition. And for anyone who didn't use Fusion, that was 
personally one of my favorite features. Um, right. Nathan, one, <laughs> one thing that um, I think is just wonderful about what your department does is you really do listen to the members. As you said, we take all of the suggestions and feedback very seriously. There have been recent changes to Matrix that came directly from membership requests. Can you share yes. some examples of those? Absolutely. Um, you know, most of our changes in the system honestly come from member feedback. Mm -hmm. Outside of, you know, CoreLogic's roadmap of their own uh, agenda, uh, our agenda is is our members' agenda. And so one of the things that comes to mind most recently is, you know, when we converted from Tempo to Matrix, we overhauled how rooms were handled. Mm -hmm. And we did it so that we could give more information on a per room, individual room basis. And uh, the member feedback was that it was too much and the search wasn't really functional and it, and it was making things harder to find. And, you know, you make things harder to find, members are not happy quick. Mm -hmm. um, and we heard that feedback and, and we took it in and, and you know, in, in a rare thing, we, we rolled back. And based on the member feedback, we rolled the entire room things directly back to being what our members wanted. Um, the garage apartment and square footage for single family listings was a member request so that they could express that square footage separately. Uh, from the main square footage because we don't allow that to be combined. Um, being able to edit listings from the agent full report uh, came from member feedback. So that little pencil that's on a listing mm -hmm. that you see where you can click right from the agent full report, that was a member feedback suggestion. Um, others uh, are bringing issues to our attention, like recent searches was brought through the platinum page. And someone you know mentioned out that, hey, are my recent searches is only showing 20. And I wasn't even aware that there was that, that they had changed. And based on that, it took us, you know, just under two weeks, but we were able to wor work to get that functionality restored. And again, that was member feedback. So we, we thrive on your feedback and, and we, we encourage it. Um, the key way to report feedback, aside from, from calling us, um, I would say is that at the top in Matrix, there's a button that says feedback. And if you click on that, that goes directly to the quality assurance department. And you can write in detail what it is you're looking looking for and we add it to our suggestions list and that is reviewed by the almost advisory group for future implementations all right excellent so top right hand corner of matrix click feedback and we do have a lot of questions that have come in from our members nathan so i kind of want to do a little bit of rapid fire with some of these if we can some of them are actually Sweet. suggestions like uh steven just said we need an option for next gen homes so, you know, again, these if this hasn't already been discussed, these these are things that we can take and and discuss, is it correct? Yeah, so so we discussed, you know, next gen homes before and and there's kind of a room description right now for guest suite and guest suite with kitchen and that currently is what is recommended to be used cuz most mm -hmm. next gen homes while there's not a universal definition for what is a next gen home uh, certainly most people consider a next gen home one that has a guest suite or a guest suite with kitchen. And that's why those values were actually added a few years ago. All right. Very good. Um, so let's take a look at some of these that have come through. Um, trying to go back here. Uh, Latasha just said, I sometimes see foreign properties from other countries in the MLS mm -hmm. in local areas, obvious mistake, but those should those properties be listed? Now, we, we just discussed last week the global listings within Matrix, right. but it sounds like these are being mismapped. Yeah, so there, there's a couple issues that happen here, and we're trying to find those. So if you, again, this comes back to the report it button. If you find a property that is in Costa Rica and it has Harris County uh, selected, uh, you, you, you're free to report that, and we will get that listing corrected uh, so that it does not come up in your local search. It's, if it's mapped wrong, you can report that as well, and we'll fix the map to get it to the right side of the country that it, or right side of the world that it's supposed to be on. Um, you know, that it's a, anything that's wrong on a listing can be reported. Uh, and and, it, and for, as far as foreign properties, if they have their paperwork in order and they're complying with the local ordinance of that country, then yes, it can be listed in our MLS. Very good. Sherry said, if there are two listings for the same tax ID, should we put NA in one of them? So this goes back to the tax ID uh, violation that you were mentioning earlier. That that sounds like a lot that's being subdivided. And if that's the case, then you would put NA for both listings because neither are representative of what's in the tax record. And I would make mention of what the tax record is in the agent remarks. Okay. Uh, Dorothy asked, is there a way that Market Insight can automatically update when changes take place around the address you're prospecting? That's a technology tool. Mm -hmm. um, 
unknown changes take place around the... I think this could probably uh, be accomplished with auto email. Yes. Um, because Market Insight runs once a week. And... I, I, I would I would use an auto email in, instead for more time sensitive mm -hmm. uh, to changes because the market insight you'll have to go in and manually make changes if you need if you need to adjust the parameters of what you're sending to your client through that product. Okay, very good. Melissa said, "What about the possibility of making agent name, um, license number, supervisor name, uh, phone numbers, all of that stuff <laughs> required, uh, so we don't have to look them up?" Let's see. Agent name is required. License name is on the click. You click through on their agent name to see it. The supervisor mm -hmm. name, that's a tough one uh, because supervisor name is some brokerages don't have a designated supervisor registered with Trek. So there wouldn't be anything to display. Uh, so we, we couldn't make that required unless Trek forced every brokerage to register a designated supervisor. Okay. Uh, the broker's license number we display on the office name, phone numbers, a few phone numbers are auto populated, so they don't even have the choice, like the direct phone number mm -hmm. or cell phone number. If they have that on file, that's automatically displayed on a listing record. There's no getting around that. So if you don't see the information you're looking for on the agent full report itself, you can click through on the agent name or the office name to see additional information. Um, if the suggestion is to put that on the agent full report itself, that would be a suggestion that we'd have to take under review. Okay, but good to know that those are clickable links that they can um, utilize to get more information. Sharon asked, right. can you add the area numbers to the map? So the I think area numbers she means are like, on the map. Yeah, I think the, she means like a <laughs> um, layer, right? Yeah, the, so the, the area numbers, um, if you go to the map and you go to layers, if you select area, that will activate the area layer and then you will see the numbers of, you know, overlaid on the greater Houston area okay. that has not been taken away. So we have a question here about schools um, from Jennifer. She's saying for schools, is there a way to display the ratings or search by ratings? I get a lot of questions about this, especially from relocation buyers. It's something that's on the whiteboard because um, we do we do display ratings on hr.com. Mm -hmm. And if you click on the school link inside matrix, you can see the rating of that school. Uh, but there is currently no way in Matrix to search by the ratings and then get results. That is something that we're not quite sure how to tackle, uh, but it's on the whiteboard of, of something that if we can figure out a way to tackle, we will. Okay. Um, question here about room descriptions. Uh, Lisa asked, would you add a way to describe the primary bath features? So, you know, she wants to see, is it a shower and tub, shower tub combo, things like that. Yeah. Coming third quarter. Okay. Easy enough. That was already, <laughs> that was an approved, that was an approved change to make a clear delineation between primary bathroom and not primary bathroom in the bathroom description so that you can select safely, mm -hmm. you know, a whirlpool and not have a, an agent think that there's a whirlpool in the second bathroom. Uh, we all know that, but you know, some agents try to, you know, be creative in their responses and what they see in that field. Okay. Very good. Um, so there's there's your answer there, Lisa. Easy one. Um, listing an active status but not available for showing, uh, for instance, one week later. So basically, it's an active status. Is it? A, are you allowed to not show until a week later, or should it be coming soon in that case? So to expand on what we said earlier, while you can't have showings while you're in coming soon, you don't have to have showings while you're in the active status. In the showing instructions field, they should have a value selected temporarily no showings. So if they're not allowing showings, that's fine. A listing could never have showings. That's that's the seller's right to not allow anyone to ever come into their home to, to do a showing. Mm -hmm. And if so, then the value needs to be selected in the showing instructions temporarily no showings. And if they don't have that selected, that goes back to report it and reporting them so that we can make them have it selected. Okay, very good. Um, Marilee said, wishing for a specific category for barn dominium properties. Coming third quarter. <laughs> Very good. Is there a way to search for garage apartments? Eva's asking. Uh, yeah, there's a, on the, on the exterior description, there is a detached garage apartment, uh, slash quarters value that you can select and search there. 
or if you're not necessarily concerned with a garage apartment, but you want the guest suite, you can use room description to search by guest suite mm -hmm. or guest suite with kitchen. Okay. Um, question about garage number of spaces. Trish is saying agents are not adding the number of spaces. Um, you know, can this be a required field? It was an oversight and we are in the process of correcting this. Um, when it was reported to us by an appraiser that, that there was an increasing number of listings that weren't showing the number of garage spaces, we, uh, we did an internal audit and found that somehow that business rule didn't carry over to matrix. And I expect in the next week or so that that field will become required again and shore up that issue. And just like with any other required field, if they don't put the right number in there, it can be reported so that we can have it corrected. Okay, very good. Is there any idea when CoreLogic could add drive time as a search field like HAR.com has? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't have a good answer for that one. All right. Uh, but, it, but it is something we can look at, that we can look into. Yes. Um, I would love it if there could be more favorites. I think she means favorite searches. I use this every day for client searches. So just a so we we'll take feedback and send it back to to CoreLogic. I mean, one of the one of the issues you want to contain is outside of external links. There's really no widget that's overly large on the homepage, and so the the point of limiting the number of items on a widget is to keep it from taking over an entire column, um, so that you don't have to scroll down to see all the information. But I don't I don't see any harm in asking if it could be 15 or 20. But after 20, I think it gets to be too many rows on the page but i certainly understand and appreciate you know the enthusiasm for trying to have a bunch of searches that you can quickly access all right very good there is there a time limit when an active listing hits the mls and there's no photo at all yes so the mls rules state that you must have at least six unique images within 10 days of the list date and the vast majority of listings comply with that in fact most listings don't even go active without having the images already because you know agents know they need images on the listing mm -hmm. and if they're not within 10 days the system automatically sends a notice to the listing agent saying they're in violation they have five days to get the required number of images into the mls all right we had some questions about uh leads which i know is more of the technology side but in case you might know the answer here um, and I guess this is more of a suggestion that came in from Chanel. Can lead information require a phone number? So I know that's more on the technology side than what you're dealing with. I mean, we, yeah, and, and, it, and it absolutely is something that would go through TAG, uh, the technology advisory group. It's one of those we absolutely could make the phone number required, but how many fewer leads would be generated as a result of requiring a consumer to provide that level of contact information? Mm -hmm. um, that's a discussion for the technology advisory group to have uh, because I could see both sides of that of that coin. OK, very good. Um, there are thousands of home flippers out there. Is there a better way to identify these properties for listing agents? So I'm assuming you're looking for a, a property that's undervalued or that may need renovation. <clears throat> There's there's currently not, not really, uh, outside of using your own market knowledge and and leveraging that against the properties that you're searching for uh, to identify what a good distressed or a distressed property may be for you. Uh, so I would say there's not a better way than what you may be doing right now. Okay. Can we add if RV parking is allowed? I believe yep. RV parking is in the, oh, is allowed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that would be a deed restriction type thing. Um, if, if that's something that is specific, we could look at adding that into the restrictions field as, as an option. Uh, but I would, I would say that if a subdivision doesn't have deed restrictions that RV parking is allowed, of course, that's too global of an answer. So we'll put that in our suggestions list to review. Yeah, definitely. Um, is there a possibility to send auto emails to a phone number? Not yet. Okay. All right. So that looks like most of the questions. We did get one other comment from Trish about um, distressed, distressed option needed. So another we can research that there. the problem the problem with distress is what is distressed what mm -hmm. qualifies distressed what doesn't qualify distressed 
is whenever you want to add a, a what could be considered a vague term is you you the MLS for us to add a term we have to be able to define it mm-hmm. and make sure that everyone agrees on the definition of it uh, before it's added. All right, very good, Nathan. You've shared so much information with us, and I love that we can do those rapid fire questions with you, and you know the answers, <laughs> so we really appreciate that. Um, and for anybody that's watching the replay, if you do also have comments or questions or suggestions, type those in because we obviously keep reviewing those comments throughout the week. Um, Nathan, are there any anything else you want our our members to know? And we'll go ahead and share the slides in the comments as well. No, I just want to thank our members for being the vocal group that they are. You know, our MLS is what our members make it. And all we are as the stewards to implement the things they want us to do. And, you know, keep bringing the feedback because the feedback is the blood of the MLS continuing to evolve and improve with the market changes. And, you know, we're here for you. All right. Very good. Well, that is it for this Member Focus Monday. Next Monday, we will be back with Dr. Steven Kleinberg with the... uh, Kinder Institute of Urban Development and Research. So that should be another great show. Have a good week, everyone. We'll see you next Monday. Bye-bye. Bye.